Hi students, today we will be discussing about phenylketonuria. This is a disease that is produced when this enzyme is defective. The enzyme is phenylalanine hydroxylase. What does this enzyme do? We have already read in phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism that phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine by this enzyme. Okay. Now you should know the cofactor is tetrahydrobioctarine. Okay. In almost any hydroxylation reaction, this is the cofactor. So phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine. You should know also that tyrosine is not an essential amino acid, but phenylalanine is. Since phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine in our body, therefore tyrosine is not essential. This is why this disease is actually very vital, right? So first things are first, this enzyme is defective or rather this step is defective. This conversion does not happen. So what can be the two reasons, right? Why phenylalanine cannot be converted to tyrosine. Number one, this enzyme itself is defective. Right? It may be in occurring in less proportion, it may be absent or in a minor case, the level of this enzyme may be alright, but the level of cofactor is deficient. Tetrahydrobioptarin is the cofactor. Okay, It is converted to dihydrobioptarin via this reaction and again it requires NADPH to be regenerated. This enzyme is also known as dihydrobioptarin reductase. So either deficiency of tetrahydrobioptarin or deficiency of dihydrobioptarin reductase or majorly deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase can all lead to phenylketonuria. So these are the causes of phenylketonuria. All right. What happens? Otherwise, phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine. We all know. But since in this case, this conversion pathway is totally blocked, phenylalanine will be shunted or diverted to form other products. If you look in detail, these are the alternate product from over accumulated phenylalanine. Hyperphenylalanemia is a cause. So phenylalanine can be transaminated to form phenylpyruvate, decarboxylated to form phenylacetate and further reduced to form phenyllactate. So if examiner asks you, what are the byproducts of phenylketonuria? I mean, what are the products that are accumulated in phenylketonuria, accumulated and excreted in urine? Those are phenylpyruvate, phenylacetate, and phenyllactate. Okay, you should remember these three names. Now, let us look at the disease process itself. Firstly, this is not a very common nor a very rare disease. Okay, it's an autosomal recessive in inheritance and it nearly occurs in 1 in 10,000 to 25,000, so roughly 1 in 20,000 birth. Now given the population of India, that is my country, it's quite, I mean, prevalent, okay. So what are the clinical manifestations? To uh, Let us first look at the clinical manifestation and then we will try to explain why those happens. Number one, the child is mentally retarded. This is the main concern, why we are focusing on early diagnosis of this disease. This belongs to an inborn error of metabolism, all right, along with agitation, hyperactivity, tremor because of a neurotransmitter disorder. It is also accompanied by hypopigmentation and mousy body odor. Now, all these are explained, all these can be explained. Number one, mousy body odor due to accumulation of phenyl acetic acid and ultimately uh, trickling of phenyl acetic acid in sweat. Okay, phenyl acetic acid has got a characteristic odor, so mousy body odor. Hypopigmentation since tyrosine is not formed from phenylalanine, the products that are formed from tyrosine are also depleted, and that are the main reason why these symptoms are happening. Hypopigmentation because defective melanin formation from tyrosine tremor, agitation, and convulsion because of defective formation of neurotransmitters and catecholamine from tyrosine and mental retardation due to defective production of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is extremely important in early brain development. That's why cretin babies also feature mental retardation. All right. So since thyroid hormone synthesis is also defective in phenylketonuria, so the child suffers from mental retardation. So please remember these clinical manifestation as well as their explanations. Okay. Next, we should look at the laboratory diagnosis. How we can diagnose this disease. As you already understood by now, phenylalanine 
cannot be converted to tyrosine so there will be excess accumulation of phenylalanine in blood it is seen phenylalanine is more than 20 times than it should be so in normal case phenylalanine level is generally 1 mg per deciliter but in case of phenylketonuria we abbreviate that as PKU it's more than 20 mg per deciliter now whenever any amino acid needs to be diagnosed it ready, it's readily done by chromatography and phenylketonuria is no exception okay it is demonstrated by chromatography either it can be liquid chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography that is hplc paper chromatography thin layer chromatography anything you can think of this can be diagnosed however if you are asked the best method the gold standard that is always mass spectrometry of course it's costly but it's the most reliable uh, method where two mass spectrometers are arranged in tandem one to separate and one to diagnose is known as tandem mass spectrometry also known as msms okay so if you are given one test if an mcq comes one test to confirm the diagnosis of any inborn error of metabolism for any amino aciduria or anything the answer will be msms or tandem mass spectrometry or mass spectrometry next option if it's asked then we will choose chromatography of course these are all analytical methods nowadays a genetic method are also their dna probes but you should know one historical method that is guthrie's test now guthrie's test is a bacterial inhibition assay in order to understand mechanism of uh, bacterial inhibition assay you should know how microbiological growth occurs okay so please pay attention what happens uh, normally bacteria are grown in a culture media okay there is a culture plate or broth or whatever in which the bacteria are inoculated and it's kept in an incubator this culture media contains essential nutrients for bacterial growth so with time bacteria will grow and colonies will be formed so this case the bacteria that we are using is known as bacillus subtilis okay subtilis but b is silent we pronounce it as bacillus subtilis or b subtilis b subtilis or bacillus subtilis needs phenylalanine for growth all right the media that we are choosing in guthrie's test is phenylalanine depleted or deficient media so if normally we inoculate bacteria or bacillus subtilis it will not grow if we incubate the media with normal serum that doesn't contain adequate amount of phenylalanine so bacteria will not grow however whenever a serum of a patient of phenylketonuria is incubated with this uh, culture media it contains a lot of phenylalanine more than 20 times and this will provide adequate nutrition for bacillus subtilis and then bacillus subtilis will grow so if Guthrie's test is positive, it means bacillus subtilis will grow and patient has phenylketonuria. And normally, if Guthrie's test is negative, bacteria will not grow. Alright? So, if bacteria grows, it's bad news. Of course, it's good news for the observer, but it's bad news for the patient. So, it's known as bacterial inhibition assay. Okay? Normally, it's inhibited, but in case of phenylketonuria, bacteria will grow. Right? And as I told you, nowadays, we have got direct DNA probes that can diagnose the defective area of the gene if the enzyme that is coding phenylalanine hydroxylase or dihydrobiopterin reductase are deficient. Okay, so gene probes or DNA probes are the modern diagnostic modalities. And another test uh, that uses this uh, chemical method, which is also of historical importance, is ferrichloride test. Ferrichloride test can diagnose phenylketone in urine. So, since in phenylketonuria, I already told you phenylalanine forms phenylketone, one drop of urine, if uh, I mean one drop of ferrichloride, if it's added to the patient's urine, it will give a transient blue-green color. And that means the test is positive. So, historical importance, Guthrie's test and ferrichloride test that can be done in labs with very limited setup, okay, especially ferrichloride test, Guthrie's test is historic. Uh, in moderate setup, we can do uh, chromatography, bead paper, thin layer liquid chromatography or HPLC and in uh, reference labs and big setup to confirm, we must do tandem mass spectrometry. Okay. So next, we will look at the 
uh, and a very important for undergraduate students since it's phenyl ketonuria the name already contains ketonuria because phenyl ketones are formed in uh, i mean formed and excreted in blood so a test for ketone bodies will also be positive so remember rotheras test is positive whenever rotheras test is positive generally you tend to ans i mean examiner tend to ask question what are ketone bodies name some ketone bodies how are ketone bodies formed name the disorder then we say starvation or diabetic ketoacidosis but examiner might specifically ask you name a disorder of protein or amino acid metabolism in which rotheras test is positive remember he or she is asking phenyl ketonuria then if you answer this he can go into amino acid metabolism and you can get a lot of questions okay and lastly uh, the treatment okay so the treatment is uh, phenylalanine depleted diet in that case of course tyrosine becomes an essential amino acid okay so a naturally occurring food that is low in phenylalanine but uh, contains a lot of tyrosine is tapioca okay it's a root tuber based diet so tapioca cereal tapioca pearl barley based on tapioca are all available as commercial formulation so tapioca based diet is a diet of choice for phenyl ketonuria also commercially available diet are there which you can get by prescription one small test uh, i mean one small thing that you also need to know is pku carrier state that is phenyl alanine carrier state as i told you the mutation is autosomal recessive so unless both the alleles are um, expressed the mutation won't occur right or it won't be expressed so someone may have one dominant gene and one recessive gene and that is known as carrier state in them normally with all metabolic function phenylalanine hydroxylase level copes up with the available phenylalanine in diet but on excess loading of phenylalanine whenever excess phenylalanine is loaded into your system then the enzyme cannot cope up this is known as phenylalanine load test positive normally we won't do it ever who injects phenylalanine but in suspected cases where there is a family history of phenyl ketonuria in genetic study where the mother has proved to be a carrier this test can be used to detect the carrier state and it's also a part of premarital test where we test both the parents in order to uh, genetically diagnose the possibility of outcome in the offspring so please remember the cause of phenyl ketonuria the mechanism of phenyl ketonuria the symptoms and their biochemical basis the laboratory diagnosis and the treatment so that's all for today feel free to uh, ask anything in the comment section feel free to uh, suggest any topic in which you need to make uh, you need to you need me to make videos in order to uh, make you understand better i also got a link to my facebook group where we can all interact feel free to join that group and i'll see you soon with another video till then bye and take care